Well, good morning and uh, welcome again. Welcome those of you who are at our Pecola campus and those of you who are watching online today. We are in our third week of our five solas series where we are looking at kind of the, the five key doctrines that flew out or that grew out of the Protestant uh, Reformation where basically um, men and, and women like you and I, they decided that it was time to return to the faith of the scriptures, that rather than listening to all of the tradition and all the teachings that were around them, they said, hey, let's look back to the Bible and see, let's try to return to the faith of the apostles, the faith that was handed to us by Jesus Christ. And so the first of the five solas was that of sola scriptura. It means by scripture alone. Scripture alone is the supreme source of authority for all that we do, for our lives, for our practice to know who Jesus is, who God is, and how he relates to his people. We look to the scriptures as a supreme source of authority. That doesn't mean we can't read books or, or listen to the teachings of the early church fathers. But far and above any outside teaching, we look to the scriptures to know what to believe. And then last week, uh, we looked at what's known as sola gratia. It means by grace alone. So what didn't happen uh, with God in choosing uh, to extend his grace to the world, he didn't look down like we might do it picking up our uh, kickball team, right? Like, oh yeah, he's fast and she's, she's excellent, like placing the ball. This is a good field. That's not how God did this. God did not extend grace because we deserved it. As a matter of fact, all that we brought to the table was our sin, our God is such toward us. God, when he looks at people, his attitude toward you and toward me, he saw us in all of our sin. And rather than giving us the wrath and the punishment that we deserve, God is so loving and so gracious and so kind that he chose to extend grace to us. Now, many of you might sit out there today and you think God must be an angry father. He's someone you can't relate to, but God is someone who loves you more than you could ever no. Today as I begin, I want to, I guess it's a little confessional, but I need to give you a quick recap of our recent family vacation. Waymire family vacations should be chronicled, right? There's, there, there's always something golden that happens, uh, but we actually had a really wonderful family vacation just a few weeks ago. We went to Durango, Colorado, and I was like the kid in the candy store. And so I realized as we're driving all of these hours that I'm a lot like my father. Uh, I noticed that coming out of me because I was consistently pointing out the landscapes to my family who are repeatedly not that interested, right? I'm like, oh, do you see the mountains? Like, look at those trees. I'm like, oh, this is picturesque, like the little stream running through the valley. And they're like, stop. We just want to read or listen or whatever we're doing in the car instead of look at these things. I, I attempted to make my family watch A River Runs Through It on our vacation just so they could know where I was coming from, like these beautiful landscapes. They uh, did not do that. There was a mutiny on the ship, so we didn't get to watch A River Runs Through It. But I, I'll be honest, I had an extraordinary vacation and time with my family. It, it actually went off uh, almost without a hitch. There was only one issue uh, that came up on our family vacation, and it happened not in Colorado, but in Amarillo, Texas. Y'all been through there? Not exactly the most beautiful or appealing uh, landscape in the world, and now I'm going to forever carry a little bit of bitterness uh, from that city, and, and here's why. I get home from my amazing trip, kid in a candy store, greatest memories ever, to receive in the mail a ticket a red light ticket. They didn't even like pay a police officer, right? They have a camera at a red light. And not only that, but I didn't even get to really contest this thing. And I really have no grounds to because with the ticket, they mailed me some pictures. And so the first picture is a picture of our car with our tag uh, approaching a stoplight, which is very clearly red. And here's even more frustrating. The second picture was a picture of our car going through the intersection with the light still red. Now, I talked to my wife about this, and neither she nor I remembers at any point on our trip going through a red light. But y'all, it happened. I mean, it was there. It was pretty solid. Like, the evidence was, I don't know, I, we were guilty. I don't know how it happened. I don't remember it. Legitimately don't. But it, it happened. They've got, like, the evidence. And then there's even a video you can log in and watch if you still don't believe it. I watched, I did it, all right? 
So I'm, I'm a little bit like probably you would be. I don't want to pay the ticket. I didn't kill anyone. Like, what are we all worried about? One little red light, right? And so I start researching on the internet, like, how am I going to get out of this ticket? I'm reading lawyers who fight red light tickets. I actually came across the legislation in the state of Texas where they banned red light cameras two years ago. This, this legit happened. Like, it's a good state. Red light cameras are only money generators for the city. They don't really decrease accidents. They actually increase rear-end accidents. So I hate red light cameras. But here's the thing. In the law that they carved out in Texas, which banned red light cameras, they said if a, comp- or if a city or municipality has a contract with the company that installs them, which makes millions from them, by the way, um, they have to honor the rest of the contract. So even though two years ago this was illegal, Jason still gets a ticket. I read all through the fine print, and like there's certain conditions by which you can get out of these tickets. If you're a rental car company, you can get out of the ticket. Um, If there was an emergency vehicle coming, you can get out of the ticket. If you're Jason, you're not getting out of the ticket. And so a couple options, I can write the check, pay the ticket, or I can go before the judge. So I'm thinking, what can I tell this judge? Like, what true story could I come before this judge and, and tell him? And I realized that I have nothing. I mean, they have it on video, uh, you know, and so I'm like, help little old ladies across the street. I'm a nice guy. I don't know. I I don't have anything to offer to him. And so, y'all, I bit the bullet. I wrote the check, and I mailed it. And I'm forever going to be bitter with the city of Amarillo for writing me a ticket that I deserve. That's probably not fair, but that's the way it is. Now, when you, you think about us, and our relationship with God, you and I all begin in a very similar situation. They, they sent me a ticket, and there was very clear evidence that I was guilty. Um, if you read the Old Testament law, I don't know if you know this about yourself, but y'all are pretty daggum sinful. Like, if you start reading the Old Testament law, uh, it doesn't just govern, like, love your neighbor kind of stuff, which we're not perfect at even that. It governs the types of food you can eat, the types of clothing you should wear, the days that you're supposed to rest or Sabbath. It governs how we should worship. Like you read the Old Testament law, and it is extensive, y'all. Y'all are really, really sinful, whether you know it or not, like you are. I've I've talked to you, right? The, The truth of it is, if you read through the Scriptures, the Old Testament ought to convince you of one thing, if nothing else. The law ought to point you to one thing. Is that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. Martin Luther described the Old Testament law like a hammer, which should crush any illusion of our own self-righteousness. You and I are kind of like me in the situation of the traffic ticket, that if we were to stand before God, we would stand before God completely guilty and deserving of punishment. The good news we heard last week is that God has chosen in His grace to make a way that we don't have to endure the just punishment for sin. As a matter of fact, Jesus did that for us. We are thankful. Salvation, it's not because we earned it. It's not because we're good enough. It's not because we could stand before God and be like, hey, I know I'm guilty of all those sins, but I helped little old ladies across the street and one time gave some money to a mission deal. Like, we're guilty, but God has chosen to extend grace to us through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Last week we heard that we are saved by grace. And isn't that good news? The thing is, is as we read through the Scripture, we recognize that grace isn't applied to everyone's account. Like, not everyone just receives this grace of God where now it's lavished upon us and our sins are forgiven. There's actually a requirement. There's a means by which we receive the grace of God. And so last week we we quoted Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, For you are saved by grace through faith. And so today we are going to be talking about the third sola, Faith alone. This is how we enter into or receive the grace of God in our lives. Now, um, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Um, this idea of faith is a little bit, um, it's kind of confusing. 
Because you read throughout Scripture, and um, the word for believing is the same word for faith, and so there's a noun, and then there's a verb, and it gets a little bit um, conflated here. And so I'm going to do my best today to speak to you about what faith is first, and then we're going to kind of get into what it looks like to have faith in Christ. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Romans chapter 5. We're going to begin in verse 1. If you remember math from junior high or high school, you might remember that sometimes when you approach a math problem, um, you approach it with a given at the beginning. Like maybe given that 2 plus 2 is 4 or a squared plus b squared equals c squared. One of those things that you don't have to relay that foundation. Um, In chapter 5 of Romans, Paul is going to assume sola fide, by faith alone, justification before God by our faith alone. He's been, he spent two chapters proving that. So if, if you don't believe it, you want to read the proof, if you will, of justification by faith alone. Start in Romans chapter 3, uh, read through 4, and you're going to wind up at 5 where Paul says this. He says, therefore, having been justified by faith. This, this word justification, it means just being made right with God. We are justified by faith. Now, I want to stop right here and define faith for you. I told you I would. So Hebrews chapter 11, 1 says this about faith. It says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. I don't know how clear that is for you. It may still feel a bit muddy. So I want to define a couple of words. The, where the writer of Hebrews says it is the assurance of things hoped for, this is the Greek word hypostasis. It, it basically gives us a picture of this massive concrete foundation. It's steadfast. It is immovable. Like when you're on a, a large like rock or solid foundation, it's not shaky. It's not crumbling. It's not falling apart. It is steadfast. The, the word for conviction there is the Greek word elegkos, which means certainty. So when we think about faith, it's, it's a steadfast trust in something that you cannot see or verify. If you could verify it, if you could like go and, and see it with your eyes, it wouldn't be by faith anymore. Now, another important clarification. It's not any kind of faith that's going to lead us into God's grace. As a matter of fact, I would argue that every single man and woman who has ever lived in this world has exercised a level of faith. The question is, what is your faith in? Several months ago, I asked this question, and it's one that really helps us real, or helps reveal to us what it is that we trust in. So here's the question I want to ask for you, for you to consider personally. Um, if in the next few minutes you were to die and stand before God, Right? You're right there at the gates of heaven, and God asks you to give him a reason for why he should let you in. What would be your justification? Like, oh, here's why, God. Here's the reason you should let me in. Now, some of us in this room would be a little bit like me trying to stand before that judge in Amarillo. I didn't do it, but I was envisioning that. And you're trying to come up with a good reason why God should let you in. Now, if you've read much of the Old Testament law, you know that you're a lawbreaker. And so maybe for some of you, you would offer your good works before God. And you would say, well, I've gone to church uh, quite a bit, pretty faithful in that, maybe taught a little bit, served. I was a greeter. I mowed the lawn. Uh, I read my Bible. I prayed. I've helped people and all of that. And what that would reveal, if you would give any of those uh, answers, is that your trust is in something you've done. Maybe it's in a work you've done. Maybe it's in yourself. Maybe you're an unbeliever, and you're sitting out there, and you think, listen, I don't think there is any God. I think the whole scenario is silly. And so perhaps for you, you would say, really, my trust is in my own intellect or my own understanding. My trust is in my scientific perspectives. Um, We can put our trust in any number of things. When we talk about faith here, it's not certainty based upon ourselves. It's not certainty based upon our good works. It's not our certainty based upon how often we attend church or how often we pray. But faith here is certainty on the basis of the work of Jesus Christ for us. So faith is a steadfast trust in something you cannot see or verify, 
but it is certainly in the work of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the object of our faith. So, that takes us back to Romans chapter 5. Therefore, we have been justified by faith. Or therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is an important point. This whole idea of peace with God. We saw last week in Ephesians 2 that apart from God, uh, we are objects of wrath. And so I, I try to portray it like this. God is perfectly holy and righteous and just in all of his ways. You and I, we're separated from God over here because of our sin. The law calls us sinners. We should become convinced of that. There's what's called a dividing wall of hostility. It's what the Apostle Paul calls it. That is sin. It's enmity or hostility between us and God. So perfectly righteous, just, and holy God, completely sinful people, we are separated. There's no peace there between us and God. Because God is perfectly just, he can't just ignore our sin. That would make him unjust. If the law says that there is a penalty for sin and the judge doesn't apply the law, he's not a very good judge anymore. God is perfect. The wages of sin is death. So this is where we all begin. Perfectly holy God, completely sinful man or woman or kid or wherever you are here today. There's no peace. There's hostility. How do we enter into this peace with God? How are we justified before God? How do we deal with this, the fact that we're completely sinful? Paul tells us here, having been justified by faith, having come to the recognition that we are indeed sinners before God. And, and really, the, Galatians chapter 3, Paul tells us that the law was given to help us realize that we are indeed sinners in need of a safe, of Savior. It was a tutor to help us, to lead us to faith in Christ. So we are justified before God when we recognize our own sinfulness before God, our need for a Savior. And rather than trusting in our works or our church attendance or our own goodness or intellect or any other thing, instead we come to trust in the work of Jesus Christ to save us. Now, here's what Jesus did. My favorite thing to talk about throughout of all of Scripture is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It's what's known as the Great Exchange. When Jesus went to the cross, God looked down in his grace. He chose to send his son Jesus. He lived a perfect, sinless life in every single way. But he was falsely accused, betrayed, brutally beaten, rejected. And he was nailed to a cross. And he did that to bear the just punishment for our sins. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says that God made him, this is Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin on our behalf. When we come to faith in Jesus Christ, God takes every single sin, every bit of your guilt, every bit of your shame, every bit of your sin, both past, present, and future, and he placed that on his son, Jesus And where we once were separated from God, objects of his wrath, utterly sinful, Jesus took that punishment. There on the cross, God poured out his wrath on his son Jesus. And in no small fashion, for the first time in the life of Jesus, he didn't walk in perfect fellowship with the Father. As he hung there on the cross, he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus was enduring the just punishment for our sins. But here's what also happened. I said it was an exchange, right? What God did to those of us who would come to faith in Christ is he took the perfect righteousness of Jesus 
and he credited that to our account. You see, once there was this dividing wall of hostility. It was our sin between us and God. But since Jesus has taken away our sin and God credited to us the righteousness of Jesus, we can now have fellowship with God. When we one day stand before God in heaven at the judgment, he, he's not going to ask us this, but if he were to ask us, hey, why should I let you into heaven? We're not going to say because of my good works or, or because I, I, I did some good things, helped little old ladies, or because of how much I knew what we are going to say before God. Those of us who have come to faith, we're going to point to our faith and trust in the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And that alone, we are justified by our faith alone and not by any work. Today, if you're here and you're thinking about that question, what would I say to God if he asked me why he should let me in? And you're thinking about, well, I, I, one time I prayed a prayer and I walked an aisle. Or maybe you're thinking about, you know, I've done some pretty good things. Or maybe you're sitting here today and you're thinking, I've done too many bad things. And I'm not sure God could ever let me in, and I, I know he shouldn't let me in. Today, I get to proclaim to you this doctrine, the justification by faith alone, that faith is a gift from God, not a, a result of our works, so that none of us can boast. Faith is given to us by God so that we might have peace with him once again. Can I ask you to examine your heart for just a minute? Do you have peace with God? Look, look what Paul says here in Romans 5. We'll read one and then go through two. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have also obtained our introduction by faith into his grace in which we stand. Again, I told you last week, we talked about grace. We are saved by grace alone, like it's the extension of God's grace that would even make salvation possible. It's not because we'd earned it. And it is, our introduction comes by faith into this grace in which we stand. Faith is something we have to exercise. It's something we have to learn. It's something we have to grow in. It's a gift from God, but we have to kind of come to understand it. Now, if you're much like me, this standing in grace thing, it's kind of a challenge. Like, even if you're a believer here today, maybe you, you, you're kind of blowing it. You've made some, some mistakes, and you're thinking, am I okay with God? God, are you still good with me? Maybe you've had a season where you're not you know, fellowshipping with the church and you're not pursuing Christ very well. And we wonder, like, am I okay? Is God upset? You know, what's going on? Here's what I would say to you. Because of that great exchange, when God looks at you and when God looks at me, those of us who have come to faith in Christ, he sees nothing but the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We are clothed in that righteousness. Can I just say to you, God's not disappointed in you. What he said to Jesus is, this is my son who am I, who, with whom I'm well pleased. And when God looks at those of us who have come to faith in Jesus, our sins have been taken away. The righteousness of Jesus has been credited to us. We stand in God's grace. So he's not disappointed in you. He's not wishing you would just get your act together one day. God desires for you to live in all the fullness of the abundance of life that is available to you. But he's not mad at you. He's not wanting to change his mind like, I'm not going to save him or her anymore. We stand in the grace of God. We have peace with God. It's an invitation to walk with him, to know him, to love him, to trust him. Continues on. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have also obtained our introduction by faith into this in which we it says this and we exult in hope of the glory of God that word exult not a word i use very often it basically means to boast or to rejoice or to celebrate so here's here's what it's saying and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God because of our standing in grace. Like because of what God has done for us. We don't boast in ourselves. We can't boast. It was a gift, right? But we rejoice and we boast about what God has done for us. 
Like our lives ought to be lived with this, this satisfaction, with this joy, with this declaration that God has done something for us that we did not deserve. And we entered into it by faith alone, which even that was a gift from God so that none of us can boast. We as the people of God, if you're a disciple of Jesus, if you would claim to have faith in this room, you ought to be one of the most grateful, joyful people on the planet. What you deserved was wrath, and what you have been given is God's grace. He paid your debt in full, and so we exult. You can use that word this week. What are you doing? I'm, I'm exulting uh, in the hope of the glory of God. We just rejoice. We celebrate about what God has done for us, and you know what that gratitude does? Because we're grateful for what Jesus has done, entirely his work, we begin to respond in obedience. Our hearts begin to love God, not because of what we've done, but because of what he's done for us. And we begin to obey. We begin to grow as disciples. If you're here and you think that church and religion is about uh, doing a bunch of do's and a bunch of don'ts, and if I do well enough that I'm acceptable, and if I don't, I'm not, and I want to share with you once again, we are justified by faith in Jesus Christ alone. That's it. And even that faith is a gift. If you've ever come to faith in Christ, you probably remember when you became conscious of the fact that you were a sinner. Like you began to realize like, oh, I've really blown it. You probably remember your eyes being open to the fact that Jesus came to this earth and he went to the cross and he died for you and he rose again three days later victorious over sin and death. You probably remember coming to this understanding or this conviction, this steadfast belief in what Jesus had done for you. That's entering into his grace. That's, the, that's faith, like being manifested among us. And if you're here today, and for the first time, you've come to recognize the depth of your own sin and the extent of God's love. You're coming to understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to say to you, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day where you can enter into the grace of God by faith. And so I would say... Don't delay, like share that with someone. We would love to visit with you. In just a couple of minutes, we're going to have a time of response where we respond to the word of God. If you've never come to have peace with God, today is the day to enter in to peace with God. And we enter in by grace through faith. Now, if you're here and you haven't been standing in the grace of God, you've been wondering how he feels about you, You've been concerned that God's going to give up on you. Maybe you're kind of ashamed before God. Like today is the day to put that all aside. Remember the gospel of Jesus and what he has done for you. And today is a day to celebrate the work of Christ. We're going to have an invitation in just, just a second here. But during this time of invitation, would you just take time to express your gratitude to Jesus Christ for what he has done, the sacrifice that he made, he made for you? If you haven't been walking in gratefulness, you haven't been rejoicing in the work of Jesus. Your life hasn't been all that joyful. Man, today's a day to repent and instead to celebrate the work of Jesus Christ for you. Would you bow with me? Oh God, we're so thankful for your word that where you reveal things to us that God, we couldn't believe if it weren't written. If someone just told us that there was a God out there who, who spoke the world into existence, who was perfect in every way, God, if we recognize just how many times we've sinned against you, it would be really hard to believe that you would uh, give grace as you've given grace, that you would love us as you've loved us. But we praise you, God, that you are a good God, a God who made a way that we might have peace with you. And so, Father, we ask you for the gift of faith today. For those who don't know you, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. And for those of us who, who have trusted you, who've come to faith, may today be a day that our faith is strengthened, where our standing is, is made more secure, where we come to understand just what we have in you. I pray it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.